Harun al-Rashid, Caliph of Baghdad. The Caliph Harun al-Rashid sat in his palace, wondering if there was anything left in the world that could possibly give him a few hours' amusement, when Jafar, the Grand Vizier, his old and tried friend, appeared suddenly before him. Bowing low, he waited, as was his duty, till his master spoke. But Harun al-Rashid merely turned his head and looked at him, and sank back into his former weary posture. Now Jafar had something of importance to say to the Caliph, and had no intention of being put off by mere silence. So with another low bow in front of the throne, he began to speak. Commander of the Faithful, said he, I have taken on myself to remind your highness that you have undertaken secretly to observe for yourself the manner in which justice is done and order is kept throughout the city. This is the day you have set apart to devote to this object, and perhaps in fulfilling this duty you may find some distraction from the melancholy to which, I see to my sorrow, you are a prey. You are right, returned the caliph, I had forgotten all about it. Go and change your coat, and I will change mine. A few moments later they both re-entered the hall, disguised as foreign merchants, and passed through a secret door out into the open country. Here they turned towards the Euphrates, and covering, crossing the river in a small boat, boat, walked through that part of town which lay along the farther bank, without seeing anything to call for their interference. Much pleased with the peace and good order of the city, the caliph and his vizier made their way to the bridge, which led straight back to the palace, and had already crossed it when they were stopped by an old blind man who begged for alms. The caliph gave him a piece of money and was passing on, but the blind man seized his hand and held him fast. Charitable person, he said, whoever you may be, grant me yet another prayer. Strike me, I beg of you, one blow. I have deserved it richly, and even a more severe penalty. The caliph, much surprised at this request, replied gently, My good man, that which you ask is impossible. Of what use would my arms be if I treated you so ill? And as he spoke, he tried to loosen the grasp of the blind beggar. My lord, answered the man, pardon my boldness and my persistence. Take back your money or give me the blow which I crave. I have sworn a solemn oath that I will receive nothing without receiving chastisement. And if you knew all, you would feel that the punishment is not a tenth part of what I deserve. Moved by these words, and perhaps still more by the fact that he had other business to attend to, the caliph yielded and struck the beggar lightly on the shoulder. <clears throat> then he continued his road, followed by the blessing of the blind man. When they were out of earshot, he said to the vizier, There must be something very odd to make that man act so. I should like to find out what is, what is the reason. Go back to him, tell him who I am, <clears throat> and order him to come without fail to the palace tomorrow, after the hour of evening prayer. So the Grand Vizier went back to the bridge, gave the blind beggar first a piece of money and then a blow, delivered the Caliph's message and rejoined his master. The next day after evening prayer, the Caliph entered the hall and was followed by the Vizier, bringing with him the man expected. They bowed low before the throne, and then the Caliph bade them rise and asked the blind man his name. Baba al-Abdallah, your highness, said he. Baba Abdallah, returned the Caliph, your way of asking alms yesterday seemed to me so strange that I almost commanded you then and there to cease from causing such a public scandal. But I have sent for you to inquire what was your motive in making such a curious vow. When I know the reason, I shall be able to judge whether you can be permitted to continue to practice for it, for I cannot help thinking it sets a very bad example to others. Therefore, tell me the whole truth and to conceal nothing. <clears throat> These words troubled the heart of Baba Abdullah, who prostrated himself at the feet of the Caliph. Then rising, he answered, Commander of the Faithful, I crave your pardon humbly for my persistence in an action which appears on the face of it to be without any meaning. No doubt in the eyes of men it has none but I look on it as a slight expiation for a fearful sin of which I have been guilty. And if your highness will deign to listen to my tale, you will see that no punishment could atone for the crime. 
I was born Commander of the Faithful in Baghdad and was left an orphan while I was yet a very young man, for my parents died within a few days of each other. I had inherited from them a small fortune, which I worked hard <clears throat> night and day to increase, till at last I found myself the owner of 80 camels. These I hired out to travelling merchants, whom I frequented, frequently accompanied on their various journeys, and always returned with large profits. One day I was coming back from Balsora, whither I had taken a supply of goods intended for India, and halted at noon at a lonely place which promised rich pasture for camels. I was resting in the shade under a tree when a dervish, going on foot towards Balsora, sat down by my side. I inquired whence he had come and to what place he was going. We soon made friends, and after we had asked each other the usual questions, produced the food we had with us and satisfied our hunger. While we were eating, the dervish happened to mention that in a spot only a little far off from where we were sitting, there was hidden a treasure so great that if my eighty camels were loaded till they could carry no more, the hiding place would seem as full as if it had never been touched. At this news I became almost beside myself with joy and greed, and flung myself around the arm the, flung my arms around the neck of the dervish, exclaiming, Good dervish, I see plainly that the riches of this world are nothing to you. Therefore of what use is the knowledge of this treasure to you? Alone and on foot, you could carry away a mere handful. But tell me where it is, and I will load my eighty camels with it and give you one of them as a token of my gratitude. Certainly, my offer does not sound very magnificent, but it was great to me, for at his words a wave of covetousness had swept over my heart, and I, f I almost felt as if the seventy-nine camels that were left were nothing in comparison. The dervish saw quite well what was, what was passing in my mind, but he did not show what he thought of my proposal. My brother, he answered quietly, you know as well as I do that you are behaving unjustly. It was open to me to keep my secret and to reserve the treasure for myself. But the fact that I have told you of his existence shows that I had a confidence in you and hope to earn your gratitude forever by making your fortune as well as mine. But before I reveal to you the secret of the treasure, you must swear that after we have loaded the camels with as much as they can carry, you will give half to me and let us go our own ways. I think you will see that this is fair, for if you present me with 40 camels, I on my side will give you the means of buying a thousand more. I could not, of course, deny that what the dervish said was perfectly reasonable, but in spite of that, the thought he would be as rich as I was, was unbearable to me. <clears throat> Still, there was no use in discussing the matter and I had to accept his conditions or bewail to the end of my life the loss of immense wealth. So I collected my camels and set out under the guidance of the dervish. After walking some time, we reached what looked like a valley, but with such a, such a narrow entrance, my camels could only pass one by one. <clears throat> the little valley, or open space, was shut in by two mountains, whose sides were formed of straight cliffs which no human could climb. When we were exactly between these mountains, the dervish stopped. Make your camels lie down in this open space, he said, so we can easily load them. Then we will go to the treasure. I did what I was bid and rejoined the dervish. He was trying to kindle a fire out of some dry wood. As soon as it was alight, he threw on it a handful of perfumes and pronounced a few words that I did not understand. Immediately, a thick column of smoke rose high into the air. He separated the smoke into two columns. And then I saw a rock which stood like a pillar between the two mountains slowly open and a splendid palace appear within. <clears throat> but commander of the faithful, the love of gold had taken such possession of my heart I could not even stop to examine the riches, but fell upon the first pile of gold within my reach and began to heap it into a sack I had brought with me. The dervish likewise set to work but I soon noticed that he confined himself to collecting precious stones, and I felt I should be wise to follow his example. At length the camels were loaded with as much as they could carry, and nothing remained but to seal up the treasure and go our own ways. Before, however, this was done, the dervish went up to a great golden vase, beautifully engraved, and took from it a small wooden box which he hid in the bosom of his dress merely saying that it contained a special kind of ointment. 
Then he once more kindled the fire, threw on the perfume, murmured the unknown spell, and the rock closed and stood as whole as before. The next thing was to divide the camels, after which we t each took command of our own and marched out of the valley, till we reached the place in the high road where the routes diverge. Then we parted, the dervish going towards Balsora and I to Baghdad. We embraced each other tenderly, and I poured out my gratitude for the honour he had done me in singling me out for this great wealth. And having said a hearty farewell, we turned our backs and hastened after our camels. I had hardly come up with mine when the demon of envy filled my soul. What does Dervish want with riches like that? I said to myself. He alone has the secret of the treasure and can always go back and get as much as he wants. I halted my camels by the roadside and ran back after him. I was a quick runner and it did not take me long to come up with him. My brother, I exclaimed as soon as I could speak. Almost at the moment of our leave taking, a reflection occurred to me which is perhaps new to you. You are a dervish by profession and live a very quiet life, only caring to do good and careless of the things of this world. You do not realise the burden that you lay upon yourself when you gather into your hands such great wealth, besides the fact that no one who is not accustomed to camels from his birth can ever manage the stubborn beasts. If you are wise, you will not encumber yourself with more than thirty, and you will find those trouble enough. You are right, replied the dervish, who understood me quite well, but did not wish to quarrel over the matter. I confess I had not thought about it. Choose any ten you like and drive them before you. I selected ten of the best camels, and we proceeded along the road to rejoin those I had left behind. I had got what I wanted, but I found the dervish so easy to deal with that I regretted that I had not asked for ten more. I looked back. He had only got a few paces, and I called after him. Uh, my brother, I said, I am unwilling to part from you without pointing out what I think you scarcely grasp, scarcely grasp, that large experience of camel driving is necessary to anyone who intends to get, te keep together a troop of thirty. In your own interest, I feel sure that you would be much happier if you entrusted ten more of them to me, for with my practice it is, it is all one to me if I take two or a hundred. As before, the dervish made no difficulties, and I drove off ten camels in triumph, leaving him only with twenty for his share. I now had sixty, and anyone might ima have imagined that I should be content. But, commander of the faithful, there is a proverb that says, the more one has, the more one wants. So it was with me. I could not rest as long as one solitary camel remained to the dervish. Returning to him, I redoubled my prayers and promised promises of eternal gratitude until the last twenty were in my hands. Make good use of them, my brother, said the holy man. Remember, riches sometimes have wings if we keep them for ourselves, and the poor are at our gates expressly that we might help them. My eyes were so blinded by gold that I paid no heed to his wise, wise counsel and only looked about for something else to grasp. Suddenly, I remembered the little box of ointment the dervish had hidden, which most likely contained a treasure more precious than all the rest, and I observed. What are you going to do with that little box of ointment? Hardly seems worth taking with you. You might as well let me have it. Really, a dervish who has given up the world has no need of ointment. Oh, if only he had refused my request. By then, supposing he had, I should have got possession of it by force, so great was the madness that had laid upon me. However, far from refusing it, the dervish at once held it out, saying gracefully, Take it, my friend, and if there's anything else I can do to make you happy, you must let me know. Directly the box was in my hand, I wrenched off the cover. You are so kind, I said. Tell me, I pray you, what are the virtues of this ointment? They are most curious and interesting, replied the dervish. If you apply a little of it to your left eye, you will behold in an instant all the treasures hidden in the earth. But beware lest you touch your right eye with it, or your sight will be destroyed for ever. His words excited my curiosity to the highest pitch. Make trial on me, I implore you, I cried, holding out the box to the dervish. You will know how to do it better than I. 
and I am burning with impatience to test its charms. The dervish took the box I had extended to him, and bidding me shut my left eye, touched it gently with the ointment. When I opened it again, I saw spread out, as it were, before me, treasures of every kind and without number. But as all this time I had been obliged to keep my right eye closed, I had been obliged to keep my right eye closed, which was very fatiguing, I begged the dervish to apply the ointment to that eye also. If you insist upon it, I will do it, answered the dervish. But you remem must remember what I told you just now. If the ointment touches your right eye, you will become blind. Unluckily, in spite of my having proved the truth of the dervish's words in so many instances, I was firmly convinced that he was now keeping concealed from me some hidden and precious virtue of the ointment. So I turned a deaf ear to all he said. My brother, I replied, smiling, I see that you are joking. It is not natural that the same ointment should have two such exactly opposite effects. It is true all the same, answered the dervish, and it would be well for you if you believed my word. But I would not believe, and, dazzled by the greed of avarice, I thought that if, w if one eye could show me riches, the other might teach me how to get possession of them. And I continued to press the dervish to anoint my right eye, but this he resolutely declined to do. After having conferred such benefits on you, said he, I am loath indeed to work you such evil. Think what it is to be blind, and do not force me to do what you will repent as long as you live. <clears throat> but it was of no use. My brother, I said finally, pray say no more, but do what I ask. You have most generously responded to all of my wishes up until this point. Do not spoil my recollection of you for, the, for a thing of such little consequence. Let what will happen. I will take it on my own head, and I will never reproach you. Since you are determined upon it, he answered with a sigh, there is no use talking. And taking the ointment, he laid some on my right eye, which was tight shut. When I tried to open it, heavy clouds of darkness floated before me. I was as blind as you see me now. Miserable dervish, I shrieked, so it is true after all. Into what a bottomless pit has my lust after gold plunged me? Ah, now that my eyes are closed, they are really opened. I know that all my sufferings are caused by myself alone. But good brother, you who are so kind and charitable, I know the secrets of such vast learning. Have you, not, have you nothing that will give me back my sight? Unhappy man, replied the dervish, it is not my fault that this has befallen you, but it is just chastisement. The blindness of your heart has wrought the blindness of your eyes. Yes, I have secrets that you have seen in the short time we have known each other, but I have none that will give you back your sight. You have proved yourself unworthy of the riches that were given to you. Now they have passed into my hands, whence they will flow into the hands of other less greedy and ungrateful than you. The dervish said no more and left me, speechless with shame and confusion, and so wretched that I stood rooted to the spot while he collected the eighty camels and proceeded on his way to Balsora. It was in vain that I entreated him not to leave me, but at least to take me within reach of the first passing caravan. He was deaf to my prayers and cries, and I should have soon been dead of hunger and misery if some merchants had not come along the track the following day and kindly brought me back to Baghdad. From a rich man I had in one moment become a beggar, and up to this time I have lived solely, solely on the alms that have been bestowed upon me. But in order to expiate the sin of avarice, which was my undoing, I ask each passerby to give me a blow. This, commander of the faithful, is my story. When the blind man had ended, the caliph addressed him. Baba Abdallah, truly your sin is great, but you have suffered enough. Henceforth re repent in private for I will see that enough money is given to you day by day for all your wants. At these words, Baba Adela flung himself at the caliph's feet and prayed that honour and happiness might be his portion forever. See you tomorrow night.